Hello, I think you're muted. Oh, rookie mistake. <laughs> There we go. We are in action. I'm Janice Hutton from Hutton Health, and I'm really excited to be sharing a coffee with Paul Wren, a control and change specialist. Paul, do you want to tell us about yourself? Yep, sure. Um, good to see you, and uh, good to know we've, we've got this all working. Technology has done it. Um, yes, my name is Paul Wren, um, a control practitioner and my coach. Um, I work predominantly with people suffering from all forms of mental health, so or issues with their health, so I say it might be anxiety, fears, phobias, sometimes depression, uh, insomnia, and also addictions, and also some of the nicer stuff. We talk about building their confidence or um, looking at a new job change. It's not always doom and gloom, but it is a case of if our mind is holding us back, then we want to stop the block. And if it's just slowing us down, then let's change that and help it speed us up. Fantastic. And Paul, we had a lovely conversation a few days ago about confidence. And you had some really great things to share about what a general lack of confidence can come down to. Do you want to share with people what, when people are experiencing a lack of confidence, what that can be attributed to? Yeah, sure. Um, it can, funny enough, confidence is, I always say to people, we're, we're born confident. Okay. If you ever look at our little ones, if you've got children, when you look at them running around, there's nothing holds them back. They don't care. They seem to just pick up any toy, anything. You can't never say to them, you can't do that because they just do. Um, so we tend to be born 100% confident and we're ready and ready to go. And then little things start to change as we go through life. We had that first um, little knock at school or we go, maybe we are falling off a bike or maybe even to a driving lesson or a driving test that fails. And those little comments or those little experiences start to build up. Um, and quite often, they, unfortunately, it comes down to something maybe even bullying at school or just somebody says, oh, you're not very good at that, are you? At that moment, it goes in subconsciously and our mind starts to think, oh, maybe I'm not. And then, of course, we do something ourselves days, weeks, months later. And then we start to think, oh, yeah, that's because I'm not very good at that. And then we actually start to knock down our confidence. If we were born 100% confidence and it just stays there, then it shouldn't drop. But if we start to feel that, then it starts to drop down. I always say to people, just imagine if that part that in our, in our inner dialogue effectively says you're not very good at that, actually stop working for 24 hours. So we've got no criticism at all. That confidence would be shooting up and tall because it is us constantly hacking down our own confidence. So when um, that's how it gets in there. Obviously, it is our subconscious mind that does the most when it comes to subcon uh, subconscious, when it comes to confidence. And if we look at it as um what's the best way of explaining this to you janice the best way that like i mentioned the other day if we imagine our mind is a bit like a ship okay we've got the captain is the crew that's our conscious part quite determined quite you know i'm no i'm going here um it's the part that says oh i'm gonna pick up this pen we're aware of that bit the rest of the crew that 99 percent of the mind they're all the crew they run the ship they get us where we need to go and they use our emotions they use our sort of fears phobias our experience our happiness to keep moving us and guiding us along and of course if they see something they're not keen on doing a presentation that doesn't quite go to plan we go and do another driving lesson and we don't pass or we don't do so well on it they will then try to think oh, how do we do that what can we save that person make them feel more comfortable so it will basically say i know we just won't do it or we make them scared of it and the confidence dips and that's why you often hear people saying oh, i used to be quite good at that but i can't do it anymore and it's because it builds up and of course if it's saved as once he thinks great they're safe then they'll do it again to the point when one day we just say, you know what, I don't like flying anymore, I won't fly. And then we've suddenly got a fear of flying. We're not confident enough in it and we won't fly. But equally, the good news is our crew want us happy. So if we talk to them and we start working upon it, we can be happy again. We can start moving forward again. And I find this an awful lot. And I think you're, you're definitely a bit of touch upon this when it comes down to um, our sort of judgment of ourselves when it comes to exercise, self-esteem. Confidence really takes a, a knock then. So I'm going to go over to you, Janice, just a little bit on that one, because I've got one thing to tell you, but I don't want to hold the line light. I'll let you go for it. One of the things I notice uh, for some of the people who are looking to make a change with their body, make a change with their health, but they have learned that their body doesn't fit into a group fitness space or a commercial gym. So they walk in and they feel like everyone's eyes are on them and they look around and they see these seemingly perfect bodies that everyone else has. 
where a lot of us have those insecurities and lack that confidence. But for so many people, that can be that that paralyzing fear of walking into a group fitness space, not being wanting to be seen in their exercise clothing, feeling like they they aren't fit enough to actually join a fitness program. They're too unhealthy. They feel they lack the confidence in their body so much that they resist making that change. They've learned that their body isn't good enough to take part in a health and exercise program. And those are the types of people that I'm really looking to help build their confidence toward your body can do it. You can learn to appreciate the body that you're in and help them gain the confidence around movement and feeling really good in their mind and their body and that they are capable of making a change, even though their mind and their confidence or lack of confidence might be saying, no, let's pull away from this. You can't do this. After many years of thinking you can't do it, or maybe they've tried to make a change in the past, but failed, tried a fad diet, failed, tried an exercise program, failed. And so each of those fit failures, which I, I don't really like to say that they've <laughs> failed those things, but each of those attempts has, has then drawn into that lack, lack of confidence even more and reinforced that we shouldn't do that because we're not, not good at it. We shouldn't do that because we're not good enough for it. And those are the, some of the people that I come into contact with through Hutton Health. Awesome. No, you hit a lovely nail on the head there when you mentioned about failures, because we were often, how many times do you find that we fear a mistake? <clears throat> We've done something and it didn't quite go to plan. So then we thought we don't want to do it again in case we make the same mistake. The problem being then is we will be doomed to make the same mistake because we, we haven't taken the learning from it. And I often work with clients about that thing and to say, hang on a minute, it's really good. When you watch children in particular or when we've experienced something that we really like, yes, we might make a mistake on it. But we, if we learn from it, then we won't be doomed to make that mistake. Then our confidence will grow. And I say to people, actually, sometimes those mistakes are great. Um, I've heard anyone seen a Facebook post I've put out, I think it was last year, year before, one classic mistake I did, don't ever open a can of paint with a chisel because it slips and it goes through your hand. Um, it's a, a silly mistake, but it's one of those things that when you rush and you get stressed, you you leap out, oh, I've done, I've done it, okay, brilliant. And after probably open that can a million times like that before, and I've reached out, got the wrong tool, slipped. But I've learned, okay, now, right next to the cans of paint is a proper bar for it. This is a blunt end, and it opens paint perfectly. And I've learned from it. I know it's a silly example, but it's that one of those things that we say then suddenly, you know, it's not like um, I can't do DIY anymore. It's not like I'm rubbish at opening cans of paint. I am with chisels, but I can't not with a, a like a proper bar. And again, it's learning that those right tools. And it's funny you mentioned that, um, especially when you mentioned the the um, the right exercise clothes, because I've always just gone short t-shirts to the gym. And that's not a problem. But I think I might mention it once to you before. There was a particular area of equipment right at the end of the gym, which has all got these. Um, I call it the monkey bars, like pulleys, and it's a great one. I think I saw one of your lives, and it was awesome because you were doing it, it was really fast and speeding up, and it was a lovely video. <clears throat> Sorry, my dog's going mad downstairs. Um, but it was one of those things that I literally went all around the machines. I spoke to the gym. I'd done everything, and I loved it. But I never went up there because everybody up there was really, really fit and strong. They were double the size of me. They were sort of rippling muscles. And they seemed to just know how to get the most out of that bit of the machine. And then one day I was thought, well, the only reason why I don't really know is A, because they look really good and fit and strong, and B, because I don't actually want to make a mistake on that bar you know, and pull a muscle or, or just look stupid because I can't lift it. So in the end, I got when I went over there, got the nice instructor, he had a spare, I made sure it was quiet. And he talked to me all through and I learned it and I went down, I done a little read, you know, a little spell on it. And I thought, God, it's actually pretty good. You know, my, my back pain was gone. And I was like, oh, awesome. I feel really good. A couple of weeks later, I went in there and I was up there on my own. And then a group of about three or four really, really strong. So they looked like bouncer types and they were really, really good. They all come over and of course they went from my sort of puny, whatever it was, 40, 50k straight down to about 120 and they were, and I was like, okay, I can't do that. And then I made a mistake. I'd done something on one of their new machines and I couldn't quite get it right. And then they come over and they chatted to me and they were the nicest guys under the sun. And next minute we were training together. Obviously I was on 30, 40k and they were on 120, but it was brilliant. And I tell you, my confidence was soaring then. I come off of that and I thought, brilliant, I'm going to do that again. And I even got one of them to show me how to use um, one of the, some of the free weights. I hadn't used one of the big bars across, you know, along here. I think it's a barbell, wasn't it? Across the back. And it worked a treat. And um, I, I basically, I've learned something then that that's what I wanted to do and what I was going to benefit from. So it was awesome for me. 
one of the interesting things that you talked about there, Paul, was getting help from someone and being mm -hmm. open to getting that help. And I think so many people who lack the confidence maybe just need that little bit of direction, need that person to step in and hold their hand for for just that moment, enough time to give them the confidence to take the first step. That first step is the hardest thing before we then can build the momentum behind it. And I know for myself, I've invested in many coaches and worked with lots of different coaches over the years. And um, having struggled with confidence in various areas, I know to look now at some of the things that I've accomplished and they were so far out of my comfort zone. One of the recent things when I published my book in September and made it to an Amazon bestseller, never in my life would I have ever guessed I could write a book, let alone it's on Amazon. Like that, that's, <laughs> that's big me. world stuff. And I never, ever would have believed that. But I had the most incredible coach who built my confidence up enough to then go, do you know what? Take that first step. Here's what your first step is. And here is... Here it is. Here's the tools you need to do it. And you can do it. And off I went and did that first step. And when I was ready, it was then great. Now let's work on that next step. But I actually have worked with a lot of coaches over the years through sport, in business, in life, and be working with people, asking for help, reaching out and being open to talking to people and getting advice and feedback. That's been so instrumental in building my confidence in different areas. Have you found that as well, Paul? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the book because it's something that's on one of my confidence boosting things to do. Um, I've started it. Um, so it's on the way. But I've done a couple of ebooks before then. But um, yeah, one of my fun things when I was back in college before I became a mind coach, I never liked presenting. I can do like a quick talk to myself or with a colleague, but if they put me up in about 30 people, it would go badly um they would say do five minutes and i'll do probably about one and it'd be mumble 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 and that's it we're done and so of course i never really liked it and then when i became a mind coach and i started working with other people and helping them with their confidence i suddenly thought well i'm helping them i must be doing something myself so i started to look into it a little bit more and suddenly one day said there's a little presentation coming up paul do you want to do it and i literally in that second i thought yeah go on do it as it got closer to the time i'm thinking can i and i started and it went really well and i was like oh i feel really good I felt so confident that somebody said, well, we've got a big one coming up um, and you're going to be 50 odd people for 30 minutes. And I did it. And I must admit, my confidence was soaring. And I came off of there and I literally booked to go to, I don't know if they haven't done one during COVID, but I went to a LinkedIn Live event. Didn't know anyone. 400 people, 400 delegates. And I walked in there and it was awesome. I had about three hours down there chatting away, connecting to different people, uh, talking about being a mind coach and finding information about them. My confidence was brilliant. And I went from there to actually help with several people with their public speaking. And that's how I found it. And it is, you're right, it is that little, just, is this okay? Or can you help me take that one little step? And then one thing I meant to mention to you as well is that we are so busy judging ourselves against other people. And what we don't really realise is they're probably feeling the same. And literally, I spoke to a client last night about this. How often do we look outside of our world like this through um, like a movie? All of our good stuff that we're proud of. And over here, the outcates, all the little bits. Oh, dear, that's a mistake. We don't tell anyone about that. one. We judge ourselves on here and it comes down. But we hear all the good stuff from the person we're talking to because they're not telling us their little outtakes. So, of course, we're going, oh, look at them. They're right up here and I'm right down here. And then we walk away. We forget that they're doing the same because they're hearing all of our good stuff. And they're doing this. And they're saying, God, that Paul's right up here. I'm down here. If we compare notes, we're probably about the same. And so once we stop that comparing and we start actually realising, hang on a minute, we're all doing this the same. Then we can suddenly start to actually um, take pressure off ourselves. And then we stop beating ourselves up and we start patting ourselves on the back. And then, of course, we can actually, without that fear and judgment, we can start reaching out. And then we can start saying, OK, I'm going to see Janice. And I'm going to go in there. I'm going to do a movie in March. I'm going to get fit. I'm going to... I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to start looking after myself or I'm going to go and see Paul and we're going to start working on confidence or self-esteem or get rid of that anxiety and start to live life. Once we actually start to envisage a change is possible and we've got the confidence to try it, then, then there's nothing to hold us back. Brilliant. I love that. Um, one of my favorite quotes that I have heard is um, those that matter don't mind and those that mind don't matter. 
Did I get that one right? Yep. But I, so, I love that. It's, that we spend so much time comparing ourselves to other people and being so worried about other people's judgments and their feelings about us and their opinions about us. But actually, those those who really matter to us, they're going to support us and want the best for us anyway. And one of the other things that I really like is uh, the notion of treating yourself and speaking to yourself the way that you would treat a best friend. And we're so harsh on ourselves. We hold ourselves to such high expectations. But if I if I were to look at what you've accomplished or what someone else has accomplished, oh my goodness, you, you're amazing. And every time I speak to you, I walk away just feeling invigorated and inspired and empowered. But then if I were to look at myself and some of the things that I've done, I probably am not going to walk away and go, do you know what? You're really amazing today. We just hold ourselves to a different expectation and, and have... We, we're so critical of what we do in our own lives. And it's a way that we, we wouldn't treat or think of other people around us. No, that's exactly it. I, um, somebody said something to me not long ago about that. It's when we said, oh, damn it, you idiot. Why did you do that? Oh, I could have done this better. Would we say those phrases to our best friend? Would we say that to our kids? Would we say that to our mum and dad? We wouldn't. But we'd say that to ourselves. Um, I love that phrase. Um, I love the one you mentioned. I love that one. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Because again, when we come to a confidence, we've already made up our mind before we come in. We can do it. We can't do it. But we can do it. We just got to actually make a point of saying we can. And um, you're right. Did I ever mention to you? I think um, it's one I tend to mention to clients a lot is there's only one expert when we look at ourselves, when we're looking at it, whether we're in the gym, whether we're at work, presenting, whether we're um, taking on a new, new job or a new hobby. There's only one expert of ourselves, and that is ourselves. There's nobody else, no matter, it doesn't matter how close they are, whether they're a, a lifelong partner, brothers, sisters, mum and dads. There's only one person that knows everything that's going on in here for our whole life. And that's us. And if we actually start to listen to our opinions and only our opinions, then we realise, hang on a minute, we don't take on any negativity from anybody else. We're only taking on the expert opinion. It's a bit like um, going downstairs and seeing water pour all over the kitchen floor and go, all right, OK, I'm going to call in the electrician. You wouldn't call the electrician in, you called the plumber in because you've got the right expert for the right job. So therefore, when I take an opinion on for myself about um, whether I'm presenting properly or doing something properly, it's going to be my opinion, because mine's the one that matters. And once we start to do that, I think we hold ourselves higher up on that pedestal and we actually start to think, OK, you know, we feel good. But one flip side I've got to remember all the time is stop aiming for that perfection. Perfection is the first thing that starts chipping into our self-esteem and our confidence, because we're always that little, oh, I've done really well, got to about there. But could have probably got to about there. I mean, like, that doesn't matter because I've done it. Um, I used to, it's a long time ago, practice makes perfect. It used to be a, a thing that my dad used to tell me, practice makes perfect, it's great. I was like, yeah, it's really good. Unless you don't hit perfection, then it's not. So I started working on practice makes progress. So I'm always moving forward. I may never get to 100%, and I don't really mind as long as I'm doing it well and enjoying it. And well, I think that's once we start talking to our clients and stuff and people that we work with and friends and family, if we're moving forward and we're doing well, it doesn't have to be perfect. I like that. One of the things um, I find some people struggle with having that I can't, the I can't attitude of I can't get there, I can't do this, I can't find the time or I can't find the money or I don't have the energy or that I can't attitude and the importance of learning to shift that into I can and I think what you were saying about having that vision of perfection. So our thoughts create our reality and they're so powerful. And if the only reality we can picture for ourselves is this perfect reality, for, for a lot of us, yeah. we will struggle to get there. And that's when that I can't. I can't get to this perfect reality that I want in my life. But I can take that first step. I can take make small progress and all those little bits of progress, all those little steps will eventually create a reality that will be positive, whether it's your perfect reality or just progress from where you are right now. I think it's really important to find a way to shift from that I can't attitude that some people find themselves being stuck in a bit of a rut. Yeah, I think that comes down really well um, to motivation, obviously to get started, a little bit of momentum. And like you say, seeing those little mini benefits. I mean, we're not, if we haven't exercised for years, we're not going to go out and go, oh, I think I'll do a 5K run today and do it and do it well. We might get 100 yards and go, I'm going to die. But if we've done 100 yards and we go, 
oh, that's a lot less than that's a lot more than I've ever done for a long time. OK, tomorrow I'll try and do the same again better. And then gradually we start to think, hang on a minute, that was really easy. I've done 200. I did this at a gym um, oh, many, many times, many years ago now. I did want to be able to do a 5K run in 20 minutes. And I thought, I had a moment, I couldn't run <laughs> to the end of the drive. So I thought, okay, let's try it. And I did it on a like elliptical trainer and I got some help from a couple of uh, people in, in the gym. And after a little while, I, was, I did probably about a quarter. And I was stuck at a quarter for ages. And I thought, I can't do any more. So they said, well, just try it and actually um, make the incline a bit better, make the resistance a bit better. So it was slower. And I actually did about half. I was like, oh, oh I got chuffed. And after about sort of six, eight weeks, I gradually got to the point where I could do one, two, three, and then I'd have a little setback. But I knew that eventually I would get there. And sure enough, I did get there in the gym. And probably about a month later, we had a chance. So we was on a holiday and it's by a big lake. And I Google mapped it and the lake was 5K. So I thought, all I've got to do is go around. Brilliant. I'll go around. So I did it really, really early in the morning when nobody could see me. I thought, right, I'm just going to go and do it. And I did it. And for me, that was like, awesome. But when I look at that, where I was to when I started, I thought, there's no way. If anyone said, you're, you're going to run that lake pool, I would have gone, yeah, right. Be an ambulance at the start for me. And I did it. And I think that's the case of it, taking those little bits. We need that momentum to get going. We need that little bit of motivation. And then, like you say, those little, um, little micro goals to keep going and prove that we can do each time. And of course, as long as we say we can or we will, we're going to be there, then we will. Um, yeah, there's a lovely thing I, I meant to mention. You mentioned it at the beginning about yeah, comfort zone. And so many times we feel uncomfortable outside our comfort zone because, funny enough, that's what the comfort zone is for. That little circle is lovely and comfortable. Anything outside, by definition, is uncomfortable. But when you think about it, how often does that grow and shrink for our life about different things? You know, how many people have jumped in a car on their first driving lesson and actually nailed it? You know, no, no trouble with biting point, no trouble with stalling it driven down the road and a man's gone, cool, you're going to pass next week. No, we never do. We get out of the car and we think, oh, do I really want to do that again? Because um, it's uncomfortable. But then the next week or two weeks later, actually, we start to look forward to it. Go, oh, I'm driving again tomorrow because it's now in that comfort zone. And then, of course, somebody says, well, it won't be long before we do a test on or we're going to do dual carriageway. And then we're like, oh, really? Again, it grows. And now, how many times we jump in a car? We don't even think about that. No worry about mirror, mirror signal maneuver. You know, we were going to drive from here to Scotland back again. None of that because we just go, I can do it. Until we come across another challenge and then we start the whole process again. But if we look back upon ourselves and say, because it has expanded, it can expand again. And I think that that's, that's a great way of keeping our momentum going. And um, looking back at your driving and you look at how you expand your comfort level you probably have someone in the car helping you whether yeah. that be your instructor your coach your parent whoever you've got somebody there holding your hand giving you tips giving you feedback i know when you do your written test you learn you educate yourself you you actually expand and and get that comfort zone because you you learn about it first and i yeah. think in in all walks of life in all areas of life that gaining knowledge expanding your understanding of an area can really do wonders in expanding your confidence and your comfort zone toward it yeah yeah no i like that you need a you do need a buddy or a like say a coach a trainer someone to be there just to and and they're almost like a guide as well um and you you know they're sort of you're heading down one route you're nearly there and then they go don't forget you can come slightly over this way and it will be better and you're like oh i haven't thought about that and the next minute you're doing it better um so yeah, I, I think that's a, a lovely idea. And you think about it, that's from what we do from when we're when we're little, you know, when we're children, all the way through life. Even even the other day, I was trying to help my dad with um, lighting a gas oven and and having it on the right setting. And there's something out of my comfort zone because I've only ever used the electric. So I was like, oh, 180 dad. And he's like, I haven't got 180 on here. And I'm like, what do you mean you haven't got 180? And I was like, I'm have a look at it. Oh, guess marks, four, five, six, mm, on to Google. Um, and next minute, he's quite happy and uh, I'll speak to him the next day and he's cooking and away. And it's just, again, we're outside of that comfort zone, but we've asked someone, taken a bit of advice, got some movement and done the trick. Earlier in our conversation, Paul, you were talking about we're we're born with confidence. We are born with wanting everyone to see us. <laughs> if you go to a kid's playground and all those kids are like, mommy, look at me, look at me, watch this, watch this. And 
and they they want to be the star of the show. They want to have the audience. They want to show you how amazing they are. And it it's quite sad to think over the years how many people draw back from that and suddenly they're the shy ones that they don't want to have the attention. They don't want to have the spotlight. They don't want to have anyone watch them do something. Certainly try something new that's probably, oh, wow, I finally made it across the monkey bars. Watch, watch, watch. And if we're trying something new, we're like, oh, no, let me let me try that in private. I don't want anyone to see me just in case I make a mistake or I don't do it right or I don't do it well enough. And um, it is interesting how you're born with all that confidence, but through experience, how it just chips away at us until some of us just struggle again to be able to take action because of that lack of confidence. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's um. It's funny you mentioned that about that's the thing at some point it shifts, you know, from from like say, look at me, look at me when they're little to a certain point when they're in the class and they put their hand up and then they get one question wrong or somebody laughs. And then, of course, the hand doesn't go up. And then we start to think I'll be a bit quieter, calmer in, in the crowd and then I won't stand out. But it's only later in life that we realize that we have to stand out um, to get a job. You know, if we all went, 10 of us went to the same interview, all in the same ties, all in the same suits, all saying the same things who's going to get the job but if we go in there and we're uh, really confident we've got the one person that's got a slightly different tie on and we're talking about completely something different we stand out and normally that would actually freak us out a little bit because we're outside that comfort zone and but we are the one that they're going to remember and um from the flip side on that when i do confidence about um in particular about interview process never forget that we're there to interview them as well and i think sometimes when we realize that we take pressure off because we're so there trying to please them and say, please hire me, please hire me. I'm awesome. I'm brilliant. Honestly, we've got to actually say, hang on a minute. Do I like this place? Yeah, looks quite nice. You know, you're going to be my manager. Are you? OK, so what do you do? How do you do it? And we start to think, hang on a minute. And then we, we when we do that, we walk away and go, yeah, that's not for me. And we might actually get that job, but it might not be the one we want. But we feel better because we've actually gone in there, actually completely different, stood out, put our hand up. And, and that's that's when we start to actually regain that confidence and build up again. So it is a sad thing, but it is something that we can increase. And like I say, we've got somebody to help us on the way, guide us. And with these tips and tricks, it, it certainly does work. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Um, so if somebody wished to get in touch with you, Paul, to work on their confidence, what, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? um any way they like um whatever i always say to people it depends on again funny enough on their comfort zone because uh, some people are a bit nervous on the phone so they can phone me text me whatsapp me you can reach me at um controlandchange.co.uk on the website um i've been doing a one where they can book a little um discovery call now so they can actually talk to me privately if they want to message and get a couple of dialogue backwards and forwards just to see hang on can is this okay then yes, they can do that via WhatsApp or email. And the most important thing is is just to actually realise that um, it's never too late. It's never too late whether you're whether you're 50, 60, 70, um, whether you're starting out. And there's no wrong question. There's no silliness. There's never like, oh my god, I can't change that. Um, one of my favourite clients was actually for 40, 44 years out of his 54 years, um, and we took it away. And he was like, I never knew that could go. I've been out that since I was 10. I was like, yeah, but it can do. But we've never tried. We've never actually asked that part to change. So same with you, Janice. Is the best way, obviously, I've been telling my clients about your awesome app. Um, what's the best way for them to contact you? What's your preferred way? And I'm very similar where I have some of the clients that reach out to me, reach out and are, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm not good enough to work with you type. And you can, you can just see from that initial yeah. contact that, that they, they lack the confidence around their body and their mind and their their mindset is that I, I'm i stuck in this, in this rut. And I'm the same as you, where how can I support you best? If it's through email, fantastic, send me an email. I've got a contact page on my website, huttonhealth.co.uk. My Facebook page, my Instagram, my DMs are always open, even if you just need a bit of inspiration to go to go out for a walk or you've got a question send it along i would love to help and i'd love to help with your health journey one of the things that i'm really passionate about is inspiring those people who feel like they just can't do it they 
they're stuck in this body that they lack the confidence in. They don't know what that first step is and they don't really feel good enough to take a first step in it. And I, through Hutton Health, I'm able to support people from the comfort of their own home, screen off, screen on, doesn't matter. Nobody's judging. I am there as your biggest cheerleader, your biggest fan, your support, your coach, your guide, whatever you need. I'm in your pocket there anytime. And I give you a structured program that's at your level. So whether that starts with a five minute walk a few times a week, whatever it is, we'll work out together what your first step is and help build the confidence around taking that first step to get you started on your health journey. Awesome. I'm glad you mentioned that actually, Janice, because um, I was playing with the app the other day um, and then I got busy with some clients and I looked, looked back and it was bing on the phone. What's that? And it was your app telling me and it, it was brilliant. It just said, have you had a drink today? And I hadn't. I literally was like, you know what? No, I'm thirsty. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. And I'm down saying had a big drink of water and it was like, how does she know? Freaky. But it was brilliant. It was just at the right moment. Um, and it's a similar one. Um, I was actually walking back uh, from the school. And so I had actually done my exercise. But it said, have you done something today? Have you got moving? And I was like, yes, I have. I'm really proud of it. Thank you. And it, so it, it's <laughs> awesome. It's, it really, it, I could almost imagine you being there literally with me in the phone um, at that moment. So it was great. But um, one thing I forgot to mention sometimes about taking that first step is some people also, especially when they talk to, to myself um, through like a message or through that, they worry, do they have to sort of dive in with a program? Um, so I always say to them, well, let's do a session that doesn't cost anything. Let's just have a chat. And I do it either in person or on Zoom or if they want to do it over the phone, if they're too worried, like you say, about putting the camera on. Let's let's get that started rolling first. With no, don't, let's not worry about money. Let's not worry about judgments. Let's not worry about where you may think you need to go. Let's just start the conversation. And once they've actually taken the process from everything up here, which is all very emotional, very oh, I don't know, should I, should I not? Once it actually comes through the conscious and we talk about it, we're saying, ah, it sounds all right. Actually, it doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> it sounds terrible up here, but it sounds all right out here. And then you can start to see where you go. Is that something that they can do the same with yourself, Janice? They can um, touch base and start to work on something initially um, without that worry about signing up for a long time? Absolutely. I am available for strategy calls, discovery calls, have a chat, see how how we connect. And as you were saying before, um, you go to a job interview and it's not just the company interviewing you you also need to have the right feeling about that company. And you're almost interviewing that same company. And I think it's really important in a discovery call or a strategy session for a client to be able to go, do you know what? I'm I'm not sure that we are the proper fit or I'm not quite ready to take, take that step yet. And I'm really happy to offer guidance, to offer suggestions. And then we can revisit again when they might be ready to take that first step. Um, but if I can offer some support along with that health journey, I'm really, really happy to do it. And free, no obligation discussion together as well. Awesome. That's good to know. Fantastic. Paul, it's been so lovely chatting. Um, as always, I find you so inspirational to talk to. Um, I, I know I've had so many takeaways from our discussions and always value our time together. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with me. Yeah, thank you, Janice. Thanks for inviting me along. It's been really nice. And uh, thanks for the app. And that has absolutely been awesome. I'm going to have another little play with that today um, and recommend that to some clients as well because it's it's nice to just have that constant little thing. Um, and it, what I like about it is, well, it's not in your face. It's not one that is, it doesn't guilt you into, oh, my God, I didn't do that today. And you're behind. It's, it's so nicely worded um and yeah just just chatting to you i always feel like oh i'm ready to do some exercise now and funny enough i don't know if you just noticed when i started the call i sort of tend to sort of chill in my seat a little bit and just looking at you up right and and i was like <laughs> straight my back a bit <laughs> <laughs> just started to think yeah better posture now that's good <laughs> so. perfect good that's what i'm hoping for that gentle encouragement to join some purposeful movement and um so i'm going to jump in with one more thing shifting people's mindset from viewing exercise as needing to be that hard, long, arduous boot camp at a gym that leaves you panting and sweating and you ache for days after and you struggle to find that 45 minutes or hour to shifting to just purposeful movement that makes you feel good and that you enjoy. And then it doesn't become that 
that chore to fit into your day. It's something that you feel really good doing and that you're inspired to carry on going and that in that way it becomes becomes a sustainable healthy habit that's part of your healthy lifestyle. And I'm really, really passionate about inspiring people to make those sustainable changes, things that you can see yourself doing in two months, in two years, in 20 years, not a fad diet, not a drastic exercise regime that you struggle to keep. It's it's that purposeful movement that makes you feel good in your mind and in your body. Yeah, I love that. You mentioned habits there. And I um, read something about just how often we need to do to start a new habit um and it seemed to be to me um far too much hard work and far too much um i've got to remember to do this i've got to remember that and i and i remember talking to a, a lovely uh lady oh, many years ago and she said well can i do a habit with a habit and it got me thinking i thought yes we can because we've all got our rituals we've all got something that we regularly do let's say we are trying to seven o'clock in the morning we we pop down to make our first coffee click the kettle and we, we sit there don't we or we'll stand there by the kettle and we're going right okay get the cup out it's a good three, four minutes before it's already drunk and then we're on to the day. That's three or four minutes that we do at roughly seven o'clock every day. So why don't we have our journal? Why don't we have our bit of mindset coloring? Why don't we have some uh, our exercise app open? Why were you not planning our, our healthier lunch? It's a habit. We're bolting into another habit. And it's much easier to reestablish. And I did something like that with journaling um, a little while ago. And it's so easy because we, we're there. We're doing it. So to do something whilst we're doing it was much easier. And One of the things that um, I like to investigate with my clients is the how we often eat because of something that's not actually hunger. So we attach it to um, the emotional eating. It's tied to emotion or to a time or to an experience or a place. And so you always have snacks at 9 p.m. You always So you always go for them. And creating those attachments to different things, like you mentioned, making a cup of tea. If every time you put the kettle on, that's a time when you express gratitude for something in your life. You think of, you know, a cup of tea is a good thing. It's this warm, delicious drink and we look forward to it. So attach something positive to that experience and take that moment to express gratitude or to think of something positive in your life. But learning to do healthy habits and attach healthy habits to, as you said, other habits that's a great way to um, integrate some healthy things that are sustainable. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, it's very true because I did an experiment a little while ago with um, having more water in my life. And quite often I was like, oh, right, I'm hungry. And would go to, but it might be an hour before lunch. And I'm like, am I really hungry? So what I did is every time I was hungry or thought about food, I drank just a small amount of water. Didn't go for the big, you know, eight glasses or anything because that would drive me mad. But so I just thought, well, just have a half a glass, half a glass, gave it 10, 15 minutes. If I was genuinely hungry again, I think, okay, it's time for early lunch. But if I wasn't, I was like, I was just thirsty. And I found I was able to incorporate much more drinking my, in, through my diet. And I was only eating when I needed to eat. And then again, because I wasn't starving at the time and I wasn't dehydrated, I enjoyed the food as well. And I tended to make, a, make the right decision as well. So it's, it's amazing. I do like that. You know, listening to um, listening to our bodies, listening to our mind when we do it. And it's the same thing with stress eating, isn't it? How many times do we go, oh, I'm so annoyed. Where's that chocolate? It's like, is that chocolate really going to help us? It diverts us away for a moment, goes over here. But does it help us? Now, you never hear me anti-chocolate because I do love chocolate. But um, at the end of the day, it's again, we're doing it because we're getting the right reason out of it. It's much nicer if we are actually not chill, if we're not stressed and we are sitting here and we're calm and we're enjoying our favourite film and then we can have our chocolate because we're eating it for the right reasons then. It's becoming something that we enjoy, that's part of our diet, part of our lifestyle for fun, but not to really stress. And then, because it doesn't actually help. I mean, how many people come out of their buildings at work, um, have a cigarette, then dot back indoors? Did the actual stress go away? It went away for five minutes. But it hasn't gone away. So you come back to the phones and they're still ringing. Yeah. So if we can change our mindset about the phones ringing, or if we can go out and actually have a just a healthy moment or quiet phone a friend, open up the phone for some comedy, we suddenly our mindset shifted. And then when we go back in, we're actually in a better mood and we haven't had a cigarette. So I like it. Very yeah. good. Some really great tips, Paul. I'm ever so grateful that you've spent some time with me today. And um we may need to have another coffee and confidence chat because I feel like we could go on for hours. <laughs> we probably <laughs> <do>. <laughs> so 
It's been so great chatting. Um, I think we'll leave it for today. Look forward to catching up with another Coffee and Confidence where we can carry on with, I'm sure, hours more. Um, but thank you so much for coming and joining us today. No worries. Thanks for the invite. And um, hey, have a nice day. Take care. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone.